Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. If you're a chief executive, or if you think like one, and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve extraordinary results. And no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Hi, everybody. Today, I speak with Jay Schwann. Jay is an incredible leader. He founded Solstice, a digital innovation firm, and scaled it to 400 people before becoming a CEO of Kinnan Carter, uh, where they actually merged nine different companies together to create a 1,600-person uh, global consulting company. And uh, in that conversation with Jay, I think you'll, you'll find some really fascinating insights around Jay's leadership philosophy and that how that allowed him to create this phenomenal growth. Um, the fact that his skill in being an empathetic leader has also perhaps a dark side and how he manages that. We also look at how Jay creates strategy and scales it across such a large organization to keep everybody focused and aligned. And uh, we're also going to have a fascinating glimpse into the future as Jay explains what are the structural issues that he's working on, which is going to create a whole new level of, level of impact uh, for the company going forward. So this is a fantastic conversation. Enjoy it as I speak to Jay Schwann, CEO of Kin and Carter. Hi, Jay. Good to see you. You too, Richard. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. It's uh, say it's great, uh, great to uh, connect with you here, um, and we're just going to dive straight in and talk about your success formu formula. Uh, I know you've built an extraordinarily successful business over the years, pretty much from nothing, right? You've sold it, you've taken over the combined entity, um, and uh, you're having a lot of impact. Um, and so I want to dive into that and find out what makes you tick and and how you've done that. But before we do that, let's kind of slow it down um, and perhaps just give me a bit of uh, background and give you know our listeners a bit of background as to uh, what's your journey been and what is Kin and Carter? Yeah, um, well, I guess uh, we'll start with what Kin and Carter is. So it's it's a digital transformation consultancy. That's the, the category that we play in. Mm -hmm. um, which basically means that we help companies leverage new and emerging tech to, to transform in what many call a digitally native business when, when you kind of got tech at this, the center of the business and not necessarily playing you know, at the fringes. Um, and that takes a lot of different forms for different businesses. I won't, I won't, I won't bore you with, with too many details unless, unless you're interested in hearing them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's fun. It's exciting work. Um, we get to work across a lot of different sectors and, and, and solve some really challenging problems. Um, but as for me, um, and hey, can I, I just first interrupt you one second. Yeah, let, me, sure, let, yeah. let me just ask you, just dive into that. So it's a consulting business. A lot of people in, you know, um, involved in consulting. So kind of how many people, um, you know, are in the, are sure, in the business yeah. at this stage? Yeah, there, it's uh, so we have uh, just over sixteen hundred employees globally, um, and we operate across the U.S., uh, Europe, and South America. Um, and right. and there's a you know, relatively even distribution of folks um, across across the markets. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, very tech-centric engineering heavy business. So over half of those employees are software engineers and and then, you know, they're surrounded by um, other disciplines that kind of make make kind of tech change happen, like strategists and designers right. and artists and, and those sorts of folks. So okay. um, yeah, real fun group. Yeah, that's it's helpful to get a sense of it, right? Because um, that's a lot of scale to manage, right? A lot of relationships, a lot of people, a lot of dynamics going on in that kind of business. So just, just perfect. So let's, yeah, let's wind back yeah. a little bit and tell us the story about how that came to be. Sure. Um, so I was, I, I guess I was an engineer by trade. I started my career at, at uh, what was Anderson Consulting, what's, which, which is what is now Accenture in the late 90s. And I've always kind of been an emerging technology geek. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we was fortunate enough to start kind of my career at the dawn of the internet era and, and working on some of the original kind of dot-coms and stuff. Um, but I founded uh, a firm called Solstice in 2001. Um, so just, just after working um, at, at Anderson for a few years, and it was a, a digital product development company. So we would help build, build kind of custom software for, for clients. Um, and I grew that over 15 years. Um, the first, you know, six or seven of which was me learning how to actually run a business. Run a business. Yeah, <laughs> Probably more sure. than anything. Yeah. But um, started scaling it um, around 2009 um, uh, when we kind of placed some bets and, and, and kind of focused in, in the mobile space um, and became mm -hmm. really well known as uh, pioneers in that space. Um, and so uh, scaled the, the firm to about 450 folks, um, sold it to a British company, uh, which was called St. Ives in 2015. And um, uh, it was kind of a portfolio of businesses uh, was the model that is, you know, publicly traded company on the London Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And I continued to, to, to scale Solstice for a few more years. And then in 2018, my, my predecessor um, made the decision to step down. He, he was kind of went on to pursue other interests and um, the board asked if I'd, you know, be up for, for taking on the challenge and of, of moving into the group CEO role. So I did. Um, and, um, and, you know, as I joined, sat down with the other CEOs of the other portfolio businesses, there was uh, nine of us uh, at the time and said, look, you know, we got to look at the, the landscape here and, and make a decision. Are we going to be a portfolio or, where are we going to be a platform? Are we going to, you know, kind of bring the the best of what we have together, together to build something um, unique? And mm -hmm. we decided on the latter. So uh, over the last, you know, two and a half years, we have, you know, we formed what is now Kin and Carta and, and integrated those those nine businesses um, to form the the global consultancy of what it is today. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, because that's a, say it's a real scale and um, getting from zero to 400 is already one achievement, but then <laughs> kind of combining that together and quadrupling it again um, with nine sets of culture and backgrounds and history is uh, is a lot. Two, two very different challenges. I, um, you know, was very fortunate to have the opportunity to, to, to take on both of them, learned a ton. Um, and as you know, and I'm sure, <laughs> you know, it's not always easy. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I, I, yeah, I've just learned a tremendous amount in the last three years. So I'm real grateful for that. Mm. Yeah, well, so let's, um, uh, so let's have a look. When you look back at that journey, uh, what would you say your success formula has been? You know, what are like the one, or, one two or three key, key factors, right, that, uh, or key disciplines or key approaches that have you continue to apply and continue to work for you? Yeah, I, I, I would love to say I have it ratified into a formula. Um, maybe someday, someday I will. It, it kind of made me think of like Silicon Valley and the one episode where they had like that operating CEO came on and he had some diagram that he would put on his wall, and it was like this formula for success. I don't know if we've quite got that nailed, but it's I mean, there's three. Yeah, it's a concoction in a yeah, glass. Right. You can't quite mix it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's that's probably more more where I'm at. But I... Um, I mean, I think there's three things that have contributed to to um, to our success so far. So first, you know, for me, the first is always passion, and and um, it's an overused term, but I genuinely have a passion for like emerging tech. I mean, I am a geek at the end of the day, um, and uh, and you know, just understanding how to apply it pragmatically and in, in different you know different situations and in different markets and. I just find that very interesting. I just, you know, I look at it as part of us as a evolution, as a civilization. And sorry, you can probably hear my five kids screaming in the background. So that's fine. That's part of that's part of the 2021. Um, you know, that's part of the. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, if you haven't got kids <laughs> screaming in the background, you're not doing a proper job in this in this in this day. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Um, anyway, we'll I'll, I'll try to try to keep them under control. But um, so passion's a big piece of it for me, uh, and yeah. and then looking for people that have a you know a similar a similar passion for the sector that we're in. <clears throat> um, the second is, is leadership. And, and uh, you know, I think there's different leadership philosophies. I don't think there's one that, that necessarily uh, is, is the one that the best one or the one that always works. But um, I, I am a, a true believer kind of in, in the servant leadership philosophy. Mm. Um, 
which you know is is really more about um, not necessarily being the best at your job, but making other people the best at theirs. Yeah. And um, I adopted that pretty early in my career. I was you know um, in the early two thousands when I was still a practitioner. Um, I, I was a scrum, I, I, you know, I took on the role of a, of a agile scrum master for a period of time. And when I learned that training, a scrum master is kind of similar to a project manager, but the, the, the philosophy is, you know, the scrum master is not a hierarchical position mm. in the team. It's, it's like a, a, you know, it's a peer of the other members of the team and their job is to serve the team. You know, their job is to kind of enable the other individuals and remove the blockers and make sure yeah. that they have everything they need to be the best. And I, I think that that philosophy applies at any level in an organization. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we've always tried to build culture around some of that, those principles and, mm-hmm. you know, celebrate great rituals around those kind of actions. So that's been a big piece of it, I think. Um, yeah, I think um so just to interrupt the you know, what you're saying there about you know removing the blockers, I think it that is like the scalable way, right, to grow because so many times, so often it's easy for leaders to jump in and try and solve problems themselves, do things themselves, but you just become the bottleneck. And I often say to clients, you know, you have a choice of speed or acceleration. Um, sometimes, acceler- you know, speed you can go fast immediately, probably yourself, but if you just slow it down a bit, identify the blocker, whether it's some development that the person needs or some resource or some system that's missing and you work on that, then it compounds very quickly, actually. For sure. And it's, and it comes down to, you know, that, that people having that sense of, of autonomy and accountability, um, which is another agile tenant, right? It's, it's just, it's allowing teams mm. to be self, self-governed, self, um, you know, self-motivated and, 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 you know, have clear, clear, clear goals and remits, but having the ability to kind of conquer it whichever way they need to, you know, or wherever they see. It all kind of ties together. I totally, totally agree. So that's, Um, so you've got passion and leadership. Is there another element to the cocktail? And I guess the the third for me is um, a belief that business um, can and should be used as a force for good. And I I kind Mm. of believe that since the beginning, I, I, you know, I, (laughs) especially in the political environment these days, I just feel, you know, there's just a lack of confidence in what um, our governments can, can, can do for us as a society and business like, like it or not is an incredible influence on, yeah. on us. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. I just think like the, the knee jerk is that's a bad thing and it doesn't have to be, it could be a good thing. Um, but you know, that's gotta be an intentional part of a business's strategy. And so, that's always been an underpinning of our of our strategy is that being a force a force for good in society. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, you might have seen on you know my website. I, I talk about what I love doing. It, it, what I do is really the intersection of strategy, leadership, and purpose. And uh, you've actually talked about purpose in a couple of places there. Um, I mean, you know, passion in one sense in terms of your own personal purpose, but then this this idea of um, you know creating an impact uh, as an entity as a business. And um, I think you're right. When, when, it, when a, it comes back to actually um, a previous episode, I talk about releasing commitment, right? And it's actually when you can articulate what the impact is that you're trying to make. Um, and impact's always in terms of other people, right? At the end of the day, when we create an impact, it's always in re- relevant in relation to some stakeholder. When we can communicate that, people get on board, right? That suddenly that you're mobilizing them because they get excited about it as well. Um, whereas if it's just about hitting some number quarter after quarter, who gets yep. out of bed it's, for that really? It's not enough um, for, for sure. Um, and look, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I don't expect, you know, our, our, our purpose as a company is to build a world that works better for everyone. And that's, you know, the underpinning kind of broad, and that takes a lot of different shapes and forms depending on the stakeholder group we're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't expect every employee that, that works for Kenning Carta to adopt that as their own personal purpose. Um, you know, everybody's got their own journey that they're on. And I know, you know, yeah. for myself, my own personal purpose has changed as I, you know, went from being a single entrepreneur to being married, to being a dad. And, and so those right. things will change. 
I think if people feel like they're working for an organization that genuinely wants to do the right thing and is, and like you said, is having an impact, yeah. um, it, it's, it, it makes people, people feel a lot better about, you know, who they're working for and kind of leaning in a little bit more maybe than they would otherwise. So yeah. Yeah. I would agree with you there. So, um, so passion, leadership, you know, this kind of uh, belief in a sense of purpose. Um, what's perhaps been the dark side? You know, what are the areas that um, have perhaps come back to to drag you down or get you to stumble on occasion? I mean, obviously, we always have this roller coaster ride in leadership. Just kind of wondering what are the areas where you've had to perhaps learn the hard way? Yeah. Um, how long is this podcast? <laughs> About four or five hours. It's fine. We've got the time. <laughs> where to begin um oh my gosh i mean you know the the, the well, there's a dark side to all to any any change you know uh because i think you, when you're when you're when you're creating something new you're inevitably leaving something behind and um and sometimes it's easy to leave those things behind and sometimes it's not mm. um when in our case you know when we had uh you know, nine different brands, one of them being Solstice, you know, a company that I built over, um, you know, over 20 years. Um, you know, we, we, part of the strategy was, yeah, we're going to leave, we're going to leave these brands behind. We're going to change the operating models, you know, and, and how we've organized ourselves and people's jobs are going to change and responsibilities are going to change. And it was just a tremendous amount. And, um, I think, um, you know, early on in that journey, um, you know, I'm a pretty empathetic leader. So I, in, which I think in, in some ways can be a, a positive, but in some times can, can, can be a negative in the, in the sense that, you know, I want to, I want to make everybody happy, mm. <laughs> you know, and sometimes you can't, you, you just can't do that. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, so I think some of the early steps that we took, in bringing the businesses together took longer than they maybe needed to, or, or, or probably even longer than some of our employees wanted them to. Mm. You know, Cause I was trying to make sure that um, everybody felt good about it. And, mm. and so, but the, the, you know, the flip side of that is like, you know, sometimes things will get diluted, you know, in terms of messaging by trying to like, Oh, how do we get everybody's values in here? How do we get everybody's, mm. you know, kind of manifesto represented in, in our messaging or all their capabilities. And so then you end up with this kind of hodgepodgey thing that nobody feels great about. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the second iteration that we took kind of on our, on the firm, it's positioning, the operating model was just a lot more intentional and, um, and just kind of said, look, yeah, we're going to have to say goodbye to some stuff here and it's going to hurt, but mm. um, the future will be a lot brighter for all these different reasons and, um, and, and, it, and that has, you know, that has, uh, we have come to realize that. I just think it took us a little longer than it probably needed to. Hello, it's Richard here with a quick interlude. These conversations are all about upgrading how you think about creating impact. So here's a resource to help you do just that whilst staying fast and focused. The CEO's checklist for challenging times is a quick way to enhance your thinking and detect blind spots, even when things are moving incredibly fast and you're not sure what's going to happen next. You can get this powerful checklist of 17 world-class strategies by heading to xquadrant.com forward slash go forward slash challenging times checklist with a hyphen between each of those three last words. Now, back to the conversation. I think that idea of acknowledging the pain up front you know, it's a great insight because if you actually let people know what's coming, they can actually brace themselves forward, actually. Um, and also understand that it's potentially limited as well. Sometimes I see, you know, people kind of drip feed bad news and it's it's not actually the news people are reacting to. It's it's the concern about how much more of this bad news is coming. <laughs> Whereas almost if you actually just say, look, this is the journey, there is there's going to be these, this difficult period, but this is where we're going. Yeah. I think people can um, react to that better. For sure, Richard, for sure. And then it, you know, it ultimately forces the question and, and every individual's mind is like, do I want to be a part of this or not? Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think that's really important just to come to those conclusions quickly, mm. you know, as a business and as an individual, you know, it's mm. like, it's people deserve to, 
to know kind of what, you know, what the future holds for them and, and, and you know, whether or not they want to be a part of it. And I think, um, and look, we didn't spend, you know, too long in this kind of no man's land, but I do think like it became clear to me, like people really appreciate, um, you know, st straight talk, they appreciate kind of a, a clear uh, explanation of kind of where and why we're going where we're going. And then they can make their own decision, right? Of whether or not that's, that's for them. And, you know, I think that's just, that's the right thing to do. And just going back to your, your comments about being an empathetic leader and that that can sometimes, you know, trying to please everybody can slow things down or dilute things. I think it's a, it's a really good insight as well because, um, you know, it's um, often I say, you know, leaders, leaders are often really good at um, really direct challenge to people and like, this is the gap and this is, you know, where you're, where you're underperforming and everything, or they're really good at support and being, building relationship and empathy and relationship, right? The issue is obviously in the one, the first one, people kind of feel that they get used and they kind of, they, 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 they comply, but they're not going to necessarily bring tell you the truth about what they really think because they might get shot down in flames uh yeah. and, and in the but in the other quadrant uh where you have the highly empathetic leader building great relationships they don't always hear the truth either because there's this desire to kind of keep the harmony and yeah. to and to keep the kind of feel good factor um yeah. um yeah. And, yeah i feel like you know one of the analogies that i use with folks and you know, I think this can even be applied on a mentorship level, but it's like, I think a leader needs to be like, you know, one part, one part cheerleader, one part coach and one part referee. Mm. And, and, you know, you got to play, you got to wear that different hat at different points in time. I mean, the cheerleaders there to like, you know, pump people up and say, Tom, what a great job they're doing and really compliment, um, compliment them, make them feel good about themselves. The coach is there to push, you know, it's like, you got a high jumper, you got an athlete, they clear seven feet. Great. Awesome. Let's do seven foot one. I mean, you're never, you know, you're never done pushing people to that, that potential. And, and the referee sometimes just calling people out of bounds, you know, it's just like, sometimes you have to like be straight yeah. with people. Like that's not going to work. That's, that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's tough to balance those three things sometimes, but that's what we all need. I think, you know, at different points in our, our journeys. Yeah. No, I love the analogy. Well, let's, let's move on. Um, Obviously, you've created this, you know, brought together, almost, I might call it a sprawling business, not in a bad way, but in the sense that it's, it's geographically diverse. You've got a lot of people, a lot of teams, you have these sub-brands. Um, what have you learned about bringing focus to that? I mean, there's so much distraction, especially in a world of tech where there's, everything, there's all sorts of new things happening. You've got all these customers, you've got these internal issues, I'm sure, uh, on multiple levels. What have you learned about eliminating noise, as I call it, right? Uh, bringing focus uh, to all of that and keeping yourself focused on what's important. Yeah. Um... So there's, there's a framework that, that, that we subscribe to that I learned a number of years ago that was tremendously helpful for me called, called the One Page Strategic Plan. Um, and, and it's, so it, we, borrowed, we borrowed it or derived it from um, kind of a framework methodology called Scaling Up, um, a guy named Vern Harnish wrote. Um, and it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good book. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's Text, text, textbook type type read, but but has a lot of good frameworks in there, and this is one of them. Um, it was tremendously helpful for me um, because I'm like a big idea guy, and I will, you know, I will to to sometimes to like my teams, like I'll drive them crazy with like different ideas. And and so we found this framework a few years ago, well, probably ten, almost ten years ago now. But um, but the concept is simple. the The idea of the OPSP is you know, you have these big, hairy, audacious goals, you yeah. know, that you'll set, you know, very, but one to three, not many, um, yeah. but something that's, you know, somewhere out there in the future. And for us, you know, our business is changing fast enough that we'll typically set a BHAG that's like five to seven years out. Yeah. Uh, so our BHAG right now is um, to be internationally recognized as the best place to work, uh, to be one of the first uh, publicly traded B corporations and to be a billion dollar business by our fiscal year 27. So we kind of have these three, three B hacks, big, mm -hmm. big, big, hairy audacious goals. And then those break down into three year, what are called thrusts. So in three years, what are, what are some 
goals that you'll need to hit in yep. order to achieve EHAG. And then that breaks down to one year initiatives. Yep. What are our, no more than five, five goals for the year. And then that breaks down to quarterly rocks. Yeah. So what are the five, no more than five things we need to do this quarter. And it just forces prioritization and forces focus and the entire organization on one side of one sheet of paper can see, yeah, what are we doing? Um, yeah, and that. that applied, you know, when we were a, you know, 150 person consulting company, I think when we first introduced it and it works at, you know, 1600 people today, um, it's a little bit, we have a, a global OPSP and then our regions have, yeah. you know, a slight derivation for, for, for the Americas and Europe, but um, it's been a powerful construct for us. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, I call that the um, the goal stack, my terminology, but yeah, the same thing, yeah. right? Which is really, um, and I often encourage people to do it for themselves as well as their organization, right? Uh, you know, what's your your kind of 25-year-old, 25-year personal um, vision and um, back it up and t- all the way down to well, what does it mean I need to do this year or this or this month, right? Um, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, and it's extremely it's powerful. Thing, right? But it's like so few people do it. And I, yeah. I use the same for too on for, for my mentors um, and just kind of construct, okay, let's let's kind of set a vision and break it down. Um, yeah. Cause, and it's, it's funny when, when you do that, like the last time many people do that is like when they're in university. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. The last time they really set a vision for themselves and think like, this is yeah. what I'm going to do, you know, and then they just kind of get in it. And it's like, it is so important to just be really intentional about where you want to go. Right. And, and when you're, when you're an exec, you know, or a founder or whatever it is, a position of responsibility you know, your diary, people's diaries are so often full, they're crammed, they've not created space. And it's so easy to get into that tunnel vision where, you know, you get the, the buzz of knocking off things off your list and achieving projects and goals and actually taking the discipline to carve out that time um, can be, is almost always, you know, a game changer because you get the awareness, but it's just really hard for a lot of people, I think, to to step back out of the task world, right? Because they've got been rewarded for the for task achievement for so much of their life, but they realize that they need to be playing a different game now at this level. It's not just about the, the volume of tasks they can get through. <laughs> it's what tasks are we actually focused on? It's so true, right? It's like that, um, yeah, the short-term gratification versus kind of the giving your space to think intentionally and even harder these days. I mean, I think, you know, when people are kind of locked up with, mm. you know, you know, and, and constrained in terms of where they can go and where they can find space, but all the more reason to just make sure that people are, are carving that into their, to their day mm. or, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So um, that's great. Let's, um, let's kind of look at the future a little bit, shall we? Um, as I like to say, no matter how much we've achieved, there's always a next level, right? And for us to get to the next level requires us kind of changing the formula, probably, uh, uh, adding something to it or, or, or shaking things up in a new way. So I'd love to kind of understand, you know, for you, what does that look like, first of all? Like, how would you love to multiply your own impact? You've obviously, you know, got this, you've just, I guess, at the end phase of this merging of these nine companies together. Uh, where's next for you? You know, what, what would you love to accomplish now in the next few years? Um, you know, so, so I think we've, we've set a pretty um, solid vision as a business and I'm, I'm really uh, proud and thankful for the team that we've kind of created. And, and I, I feel good, like, I feel good that this is going to scale in a, in a healthy, um, in a healthy way. And, and that they're going to be able to do that, um, and I'll, and, you know, with my, my support and coaching or whatever. But um, I think the thing that makes me most excited, so about broader impact. So we, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we took on the decision um, to become a certified B corporation. And, um, and I don't know if, if you're familiar with that construct, but it's, it's a basically level. a yeah, it's like an it's an independent body, and it's it's becoming um, it's becoming more and more popular globally. But it's an independent uh, non for profit that will certify a business as being a socially responsible business. Mm-hmm. So um, 
similar to how an accounting firm will come in and certify financial results. Right. So there, it, it brings a level of accountability to, you know, any corporate and social responsibility kind of program. And it's to get certified. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's not easy. Um, but there's a, um, a, there's a belief in the system around a triple bottom line focus, meaning, mm. you know, you're balancing people, profits and planet. Mm. So there's pragmatism built in, meaning it's, you know, it, it's not meant to be overly altruistic. It's just like, how can you build a successful business, but still balance these three things. So we took on that challenge. Um, uh, and not many companies our size have, have, have achieved it. And there's, there's actually no publicly traded companies on the London Stock Exchange that are certified right now. So anyway, long story short, um, we're, we're certifying our regions and we got our North and South America region certified just three weeks ago, which we're incredibly proud of. Right. And Europe is set up to, to get certified in the next, um, in the next couple months. And then the hope is that we, we will get our, the PLC or the overarching mm. business certificate. Now that will take shareholder approval. The shareholders are going to have to vote um, in order to actually, because it requires a change to the articles of organization. Right. So um, my goal is for us to be the first to, to, to do that, to prove that right. that can happen in hopes of other large publicly traded companies following that same mm. commitment. And I, I feel like we, if we can prove that you can be financially successful and balance these other things, then other companies may very well. And it's not that nobody has a you know corporate social responsibility program, but I think this has some teeth to it and it, it goes beyond any one leader. Um, so when I'm gone, right. you know, they're yeah. still going to have this commitment. It's structurally um, built in, right? It, it's, it's making that, it's that one built. decision that, that avoids all the other decisions, right? Because you've made it once. Yeah. So I'm super passionate about this because I think it's like, it's what needs to happen. And I feel like mm. uh, it's an area, even as a, you know, look, as a smaller public trade company, that we could hopefully have some influence and impact. So yeah. that for me, is like near term, a big goal of mine. Uh, and and how's, and, and Obviously, there's some very practical to-do list actions, right, to implement that kind of uh, change. But how will you need to kind of grow or shift as a leader in order to, I don't know, to to be that person, right, to 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 make that happen, to, to perhaps to to take the PLC into that status? You know, what, what, what's your next? What's your own edge in this? Where's your growth going to be? Uh, you know, it's, it's education and understanding, I think, um, cause it introduces a new domain of, um, of things to learn and balance. Mm. And so, which that's going to challenge, it challenges any leader. Um, what I like about B Corp is it's a framework. It's, it's not a zero and one, you get a score on a scale. You got to be above a certain number to get it, but you've got the ability to make trade-offs, you know? Um, yeah you know, in terms of your environmental impact and your community impact and your people impact and your customer impact. Um, so it just, it, it, it gives you a few more dimensions to, to, to have to work with as a leader. And I think, mm -hmm. and that creates more challenging businesses, business decisions. So for example, like we got presented recently with an opportunity to help um, the Department of Defense with a significantly sized project um, and I don't think any, any, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, it's, there's nothing in the B Corp laws that says you can't work on any sort of Department of Defense type of or military type contract, but you do need to weigh, you know, what you're doing with the potential impact on society. And in this case, when we looked at it, we're like, we can't, um, we can't take this on. Like it just, it doesn't, you know, there's too much risk that, um, that, imp that, that there, there could be a societal impact that could be, could be negative and, and we had a pass on it. There's a financial impact to that. Um, yeah. But there's also, you know, uh, a positive impact to that in terms of people and culture and talent brand and people knowing that we're, you know, we are who we, we say we are. Yeah. Um, so yeah. those are, you know, more difficult decisions, I think, that we'll be faced with as time goes on. But um, I welcome that, right? That, yeah. that challenge um, as a leader. I, I love the... Um... Yeah, that's what I'm really hearing there is, yeah, that you're now turning your attention to these structural levers, right? Um, perhaps you've always had, right? Because you actually, you had the growth phase, then you had this consolidation structural work to bring that together. And now that's happened. 
this B Corp part is almost the next major structural shift, which will create a new set of conditions for the business to work in, right? Which is really what it's all about, right? Creating the environment for everybody else to do what they do. Much better framing than I could I could have done, Richard. But yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a good, that's a good summation of kind of where we're at in our journey. Um, and I think with tech in particular, like it's a double-edged sword, you know, because it comes with tech has the ability to tech drives automation at the end of the day, yeah. you know, it's yeah. a wheel in that sense. But um, that means that um, it will displace jobs as it will create new ones. It will bring down the cost of living. It has a lot of positive things, um, mm. but it also has the potential for, for, for negative things. And I think, companies in our space have a responsibility to kind of weigh those things. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So it's, it's a very passionate um, area of, of, of mine and, and, and the folks that work, work at Ken and Carta. Yeah. Well, Hey, um, Jay, it's been really, you know, fascinating talking to you and thank you for, you know, this passion that you bring. And I think your heart as well comes through, right. That you're, you're a man with a mission. Um, you want to do good. Um, you know, at the same time, obviously hit the numbers and, and do all of that um, stuff as well. So, you know, thanks for this uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, if people want to find out a bit more about you or about uh, uh, Kin and Carter, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, we're on all the social channels. I think LinkedIn is probably the easiest place to, if you want to connect with me um, or follow the business. Um, but yeah, love to, love to connect. Yeah, perfect. Well, hey, thanks, uh, Jay. It's been a pleasure and uh, hope to speak to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.